stresses were being stresses were being changed. Okay, now where am I? There we go. Those are the sills and the dikes. All right, and uh, hydraulic fracturing in nature again, ship rock. And there were some tremendous studies done in the uh, geophysical and geological literature back in the 1980s by people like David Pollard and others that mapped all these, all these fractures and showed very clearly how the stress fields were being changed in response to the natural processes of uh, igneous uh, activity. Uh, so the deep uh, fractures were vertical, the shallow fractures were horizontal or sills. And this is, this is 80 years old, this diagram. And it, it shows that, you know, just a simple linear elastic stress analysis, uh, those are the little short bars, where it is possible to very closely match the orientation of the vertical dikes measured in the ground. So nature has lessons for us in many ways with uh, hydraulic fracturing. And another one that we encounter in the oil and gas industry uh, is the injectites. Well, we've learned uh, that uh, injectites are injections of sand that is mobilized by sudden liquefaction. It could be seismically triggered and aided, of course, by the burial pressure. So that when a, when a perturbation happens, liquefaction happens as the sand structure, uh, the very high porosity sand structure collapses. And, and liquefied sand is injected. Now, examine that, uh, that diagram on the right. There's a problem with it. There's a problem. So the person who, who drew that diagram assumed that the planes of hydraulic fracture on the injectite were essentially parallel to the planes of a normal fault situation. You can see normal faults throughout the, uh, throughout the diagram here. That's not correct. There may be jigs and jogs, but the hydraulic fracture propagates normal to sigma three, and we would expect vertical structures in a normal fault regime for the most part. So we have all kinds of naturally occurring hydraulic stimulation events that have helped build the earth and the continents as we know them now. Now, the volumes involved in those natural uh, processes are uh, 100 to 10,000 or 100,000 times greater than the largest oil and gas uh, stimulations. But it doesn't matter. It's still the stress fields that govern the processes. So we see many uh, parts of the world uh, on continents where a vertical dike came up from depth and then turned into a horizontal sill, reflecting the stress changes in the ground. So companies like Pinnacle Technologies, which no longer exists, of course, but it, they were among the first to understand and map this changing of fracture direction during actual stimulation. But in order, to, in order to simulate, in order to understand, in order to make predictions, you've got to understand what the original stress state was. And there's many other types of uh, hydraulic stimulation, not just oil and gas. I'm mentioning here geothermal systems, deep solid waste disposal, natural gas development, uh, carbon dioxide sequestration, uh, maybe not so much, but we want to be able to do stress modeling so that we avoid uncontrolled hydraulic fracture. So let's look at enhanced geothermal systems. The idea is hot rock, naturally fractured, we stimulate it to open up those fractures. We have well bores that access the uh, rock mass. We bring the heat to the surface for processing and turn it into uh, power and heat. And, and I've made a mistake here. I should say electrical energy and heat because power means the rate of energy. So I should put electricity plus heat. So, we're gonna drill some wells, horizontal, vertical, inclined. And uh, on the right-hand side, you see the cartoon, uh, just for vertical wells. We're going down, uh, in this case, you know, quite a few kilometers into uh, the region where the rock is very hot. So over a, a height of, that could be a one or two kilometer height, we, 
we're going to do some hydraulic fracturing, some stimulation in the ambient stress fields. But the key thing here is trying to link those wells so that we can start circulating between them. And the farther apart the wells, the more economical it is. We can access greater volumes. We can maximize that volume access at depth with a wider spacing. That, that's, that's money in the bank. But we have, we're, we're pretty sure that we can always link wells that are 200 meters apart. We are far less sure that we can reliably link wells that are 600 meters apart. But one thing we do know for sure is that the well orientation, those two wells that I'm showing, they have to be in, in a, along a line that is at 90 degrees to sigma three to the least principal stress. If you do otherwise, good luck on trying to link them. You'll encounter problems. So well spacing, well into uh, orientation, communication of these wells. If we want EGS to work, hydraulic stimulation is part of it. And that means we must understand the stress fields for all kinds of things, not just the hydraulic stimulation, but the, the cooling effect, how that alters stresses, et cetera. So there are different ways to get uh, heat out of the ground uh, than hydraulic stimulation. In this case, uh, I'm showing uh, a conductive heat mining approach where long uh, wells uh, are extracting the heat simply by a flow of a fluid in the well, which is maybe case and maybe not case. Now, the problem with this, of course, is that conductive heat flux through the rock to the wellbore fluid is extremely slow. It's a very slow process. So you have to have very long wells. The heat is brought to the surface and again, power, sorry, electricity and heat are, are used as much as possible. So in this case, why, why, uh, why, why do we want to know the initial stresses? Because we're not doing hydraulic stimulation. Ah, but we're, the ch we're changing the stresses massively by cooling. And these are very stiff rocks in general, very high modulus rocks. So that means some thermoelastic cooling has a huge impact on the stresses. That means induced seismicity is going to be a risk. And we'll continue talking about that. So this is the EVER concept. EVER is a company that uh, has uh, several patents that uh, are associated with the, uh, the well bores and, and the process. And this is called the EVER loop process where uh, we have flow in the direction that I'm indicating there operating a, an electricity production plant and the warm, uh, uh, the fluids that are still warm that come out of the plant are recirculated continuously in this loop. As I said, it's a slow process. Here is some work from Ali uh, Gavidel, the graduate student who's gonna be graduating uh, fairly soon, early next year. And it shows something very important if you're just trying to extract uh, energy using a single well. And by the way, it doesn't matter much how, what the diameter of the well is, which might surprise you. In months, we see that the outlet temperature drops suddenly, that's called breakthrough. And then it flattens out. And you can see the effect for lengths, uh, different lengths, one or two or three kilometer lengths. So in order to plan a project, uh, we, we have to be able to do this kind of, uh, this kind of simulation. Uh, and this kind of simulation, as I said, is not so dependent upon the stress itself, but certain things are gonna happen. As we cool down that rock mass around these wells, we're gonna start opening up natural fractures when the stress conditions are correct. I don't know if the operators of these projects are taking that into account, but what is happening today at the beginning of a project may be very different than what will happen 10 years from now because of the massive changes of stress. So here's another issue. If you look very closely at this diagram in the middle, you'll see a little black line. Well, that's the aperture. And you can kind of see that in the middle of this single fracture model, the aperture is squeezed quite narrow because of the in situ stresses that are trying to close the crack. And the contours are temperature contours after uh, uh, perhaps uh, eight or 10 years. 
Again, in this simple rectangular fracture model, we see that the blue has reached the production well. It, it, it reaches the production well very rapidly so that the temperature of the produced uh, fluid drops off dramatically. So you have to know how to, how to handle this and what the impact of stress is in order to do some, some, simula some uh, simulations and make predictions. And one of the biggest problems that we have right now, and John, uh, uh, John knows this and other people know this that work in the geothermal area is that our models are not very good at predicting what's going to happen 20 years from now. So that when we go to a financial agent and say, can you finance our project? They say, no, because we can't de-risk it because we're not very confident in your models. We got to get better stresses initially to do better modeling. So this is a, a, a simulation uh, of the uh, over a 10 year period. Let's see if I can start that again. Uh, whoops, sorry, I'm going. It's always a, it's always a risk uh, trying to do these, uh, these uh, animations, but there you can see, and I'll stop it right there. So this is, we don't have thermal uh, cold water breakthrough yet uh, at the production level, we're just starting it. And this is only after a few months. And, but you do see that the uh, thermal gradient is getting flatter and flatter in, in the rock mass. That's the different colors that you see above the blue. The rate of heat transfer to the well is a function of the thermal gradient around the well. The flatter that gradient gets, the slower it is. But remember, if we really cool down the rock mass dramatically, the stresses are going to drop dramatically, and we may actually open up fractures that might, who knows, they might, they might help. So let's continue. And let's go on to the next slide uh, here. So this is uh, a two fracture model. We have two circular fractures, and we're circulating in and out. And this is showing the phenomenon of short circuiting. You can see that the central aperture has gotten very wide. So at the beginning, you see the, the, the heat flux is very large. It's the whole fracture. But then with time, it's, it's collapsing more and more so that we're only getting heat out of a much smaller area than we had hoped. Whether these fractures are natural fractures or induced fractures is irrelevant. We see the stress changes from thermoelastic uh, shrinkage and from the redistribution of the stresses in the surrounding rock. We see, we, see it, we see that closing the fractures away from this big channel. We call that short circuiting. And if you look at the diagram on the upper left, you'll see the, the impact between a standard prediction that is not geomechanically coupled, that's the dotted line, and the prediction that uh, Bruce G, a graduate student who also is close to, to finishing up, is making using his fully coupled geomechanical uh, model for uh, full stress thermal modeling. So again, for Bruce to make these kind of predictions, he has to have a good number for the initial stress. Oh, and by the way, John, we used a uh, forge uh, criteria uh, on this, uh, uh, on this modeling. So some of it is published now. So that's the problem. Short circuiting because of the thermoelastic. And again, the initial stresses are very important. Well, and I don't even have Korea on this list. We know that in geothermal projects, uh, we can generate seismicity. So how are you going to make a prediction of seismicity in a geothermal project? Now, the traditional way that, that a geophysicists will work is that they'll collect data for say some years and say, oh, well, look at this is the history. But that doesn't cut it because it's not the history. It's going to be the future because of cooling. So we, we, we want better. Now, the only chance we have is to marry rock mechanics with geophysics. That's the only chance we have to come up with better predictive models and allow us to do risk management, risk assessment, risk mitigation in geothermal projects. Once we can make predictions and quantify the process, then we engineers are going to work hard and find some ways to overcome some of these, uh, some of these issues. All processes involving temperature, pressure, and volume changes in the subsurface will generate micro seismicity at some level. This is just a cartoon showing the 
induce seismicity during hydraulic stimulation. So here's what happens when you cool things. That faint blue zone called zone of minus T, that's the cooling region. And if you look at the, the horizontal stresses through the middle, that's above, you see a massive stress drop and a stress transfer to the shoulders. The same thing happens with the vertical cross section on the right. Well, when those stress curves, sigma H and sigma V, when they are very steep, that means a very large shear stress. So you cannot cool the rock without generating some level of micro seismicity. So the initial stresses are very important for seismic risk assessment, as well as aperture alteration and short circuiting. So this is a typical uh, Gutenberg-Richter uh, probab probability uh, map of a, of a region. Uh, and that B is the characteristic slope, typically not too far from one. But the red circle is where things are gonna happen that are gonna bother us because we're gonna be cooling the rock. And as the cooling rock size as it increases and increases and increases in volume, we will be accumulating more and more and more shear stress. And we will be reducing the confining stress in the cool zone until bang, a seismic event is going to happen. Currently, nobody can predict when or how large an event or how frequently the events will happen in the future in a geothermal project. If we're going to exploit geothermal energy around the world, then we'd better get working hard on these things. And of course, there are many people that are doing that in Europe and North America, and Japan and Korea. Now, here's a simplistic uh, risk management view that uh, has been published and uh, promoted. It's the green light, amber light, red light concept. And if it's a red light, well, stop and change what you're doing. I want to make sure that you understand that these limits are, are to some degree arbitrary and they, they, they depend not only on, on the process, but they depend upon the risk. So in micro seismic risk management, we have to combine on the third bullet there, seismic monitoring and stress analysis and we need that for many reasons, not just to, uh, you know, to play with the data you know, on our screen late at night when we can't sleep, but also we have, to, we have to provide data to the regulatory bodies and for safety, of course, to track and understand the process at depth. That's really important. To improve our models, that's also very important. And to provide real-time information to operators to, to, to make changes. Okay? I believe that every significant geothermal project at depth must put into place a risk management framework. Uh, oh, okay, let's do this one. We'll skip a few slides here. Now this, this is going to be coming, becoming more and more important. A number of companies in, in regions of the world where the sun shines a lot, uh, we have Nevada here. So this company called Renew Geo uh, has patents and they propose this process. Solar parabolic collectors can heat uh, the uh, fluid, that red fluid, up to temperatures of 250 degrees Celsius. That fluid can be injected into the ground to store it. They call it the augmented geothermal well. They should probably say the augmented geothermal region. All right. And then, in principle, you can bring that back up when you need it and run uh, a plant to, uh, to generate electricity. Well, in Canada, we like heat as well, because we're damn cold sometimes in Canada, and I always like to include heat. All right, I don't know if this company has done their uh, micro seismic work or micro seismic prediction work, but they're going to have to do it. Because they may find out that things are not quite as simple as, and to do that, they're going to have to do stress analysis. We do stress analysis now very sophisticated, in, uh, in uh, fractured rock masses to try to uh, understand the development of a stimulated zone. So uh, we know that the stimulated zone will grow outwards roughly normal to sigma three. But we also know, those little red stars, that we're going to have micro seismic events 
around the uh, prop pod. And this is very important because these microseismic events in the ambient stress field shown here lead to dilation of these surfaces. And there's remnant conductivity within these, these uh, stimulated fractures. We're not creating new fractures, we're stimulating old ones. And that's a pathway for gas and oil to come out of the, of the very low permeability rock. So this is, this is important. And this is our view of a, of a stimulated volume concept. And I want to show you my standard simple cartoon that I drew about eight or nine years ago for a paper with John, John uh, uh, McClellan. And, uh, and I, I still think it's valid. In order to understand that amount of shearing and the behavior of this rock mass, we have to understand the values of the initial stresses. Uh, pinnacle technology again, uh, they pioneered uh, measurement of deformations using precise tilt meters. Well, once you have the deformation, you actually can start to do uh, inverse analysis using finite element methods to help you know, constrain the stress field much, much more precisely. Here we see on the left a vertical fracture and on the right a horizontal fracture with very different uh, characteristics. Furthermore, in thermal projects involving steam, we end up generating low angle shear planes this is data, hard data from Alberta in that, in that uh, thermal production, uh, the red, the red uh, hexagons. We actually were able to map the deformations at the surface and using a displacement discontinuity approach, find that they were shear planes at low angles, in other words, thrust faults. Whereas the yellow surfaces were deformation uh, in, in the reservoir during the production phase. So these kinds of stress solutions allow us to better manage a project. And of course, we all know, courtesy of you know, the seminal historical work of Norm Warpinski and others, that uh, any hydraulic fracturing uh, process has uh, shearing occurring around it on the natural joints. And even in uh, sandstones, uh, high porosity sandstones, you're gonna get shearing of the sand uh, that emit microseismic energy. In the ground, it's not, Cracking the rock it creates a microseismic event. It's shearing of the surfaces. So let me introduce you a little bit of work by a PhD graduate who has uh, uh, finished up uh, earlier this year, uh, Han Hongshui, who's now working for Saudi Aramco, I believe. Uh, and it's another method that we can implement with all the other methods that we have to help constrain our, uh, our stress values in the ground. It has limitations, all methods do. But if we combine it with other data, good, good structural geology understanding, good rock mechanics understanding, then it's a method that is very cheap for you to obtain more data on stresses. I always prefer the word estimation because uh, the best we can do is estimate. There's always on some uncertainty. It might be large, it might be small. So this method is based upon the deformation uh, of a borehole uh, when it is drilled. We know that the borehole exists in a stress field that is generally anisotropic. And when we drill it, there's going to be an anisotropic deformation. However, it turns out that when we adopt even the simplest model that we can, there are more unknowns than there are equations. So all we can do with this method is seek an optimum solution. And to get the optimum solution, uh, we, we try to find uh, and specify the most likely parameter ranges like the, uh, the Young's modulus or the radius of the borehole. I'll come back to that. We might constrain others like we have found uh, in our work that uh, Poisson's ratio can be constrained by uh, a lithology log and quite nicely. And then we seek the best answer using some form of an error minimization or optimization approach. So the basic physics are shown here. In the simplest linear elastic plane strain case, vertical boreholes, by the way, is, uh, we have to have vertical boreholes, subjected to sigma h max and sigma h min. When we drill, we get a change in the principal diameters, b and a, so that 
C15 is the diameter, uh, in this case, parallel to the sigma h direction, and C24 is the diameter parallel to the sigma h max direction. So in the simplest linear elastic model, you see those equations. Well, those equations have too many parameters uh, for us. We have modulus and Poisson's ratio. We have the mud weight. We have R. And R, by the way, is the borehole diameter. Now you might say, well, hey, I use a nine inch, a nine inch bit. The diameter of the hole is nine inches. Mm, not quite. Furthermore, if we're gonna use a method uh, from a borehole to, to do stress estimation, we have to apply quality control criteria uh, to the choice of a zone. And many of you will remember Dick Plum who did you know, really seminal work uh, for, uh, for Schlumberger. He was a friend of, uh, of Sid Green's and he, he was the, the, the person that established quality control of the borehole uh, data in order to uh, find the regions that we can use to to, to make stress estimates, et cetera. Well, for this technique, we need uh, to have a zone with no breakouts or washouts or spalling over a specified depth interval. We need clear and consistent and high precision forearm dip meter trace or a other ultrasonic borehole map or something that gives the diameters to great precision. We need to have the high precision. The uh, If we have a forearm dip meter trace, then we want that dip meter to be tracking vertically for a, a minimum distance in order to use the data. So we have about five or six quality control criteria that are applied to every single trace that we get from geophysical logs, but there's still too many unknowns. So we have to make some assumptions and calibration is nice if we have other data, like for example, a step rate test or a, or a, a extended leak off test or actually some hydraulic fracture tests or uh, maybe uh, we'll, we'll try to correlate it with the Slumberger uh, multiple receiver acoustic log stress estimation techniques or whatever. We'll do everything we can to, to try to make sure that uh, the models are well calibrated and giving good results. Okay, so uh, we're working in this case in a linear uh, elastic parameter space. And here you see the parameters uh, across the bottom here and the uh, major and minimum uh, diameters of the borehole. So this is a parametric sensitivity study showing you the impact uh, of the uh, stresses and the modulus and Poisson's ratio, et cetera, on the values of C13 and C24. And first of all, look at Poisson's ratio. The impact is very small. Ah, that means that if we make just a reasonable guess for Poisson's ratio, we're not impairing the outcomes very much. Okay, so first of all, we take a reasonable estimate of Poisson's ratio from the lithology log, courtesy of the sensitivity analyses that, that we did to demonstrate that Poisson's ratio doesn't have a, a, as much of an impact as other factors. What about the borehole diameter as drilled? Mm, not good enough. The solution is quite sensitive to the borehole diameter. If you go back here, you'll see it's 17% uh, you know, uh, sensitivity in the outcomes. Uh, for the uh, major, for the major diameter. So uh, it turns out that the borehole diameter is going to be one of the variables, but we're going to set the limits very, very tight. So, for example, if it's an 8.5 inch uh, drill bit, we might set the uh, actual diameter to be limited to a very narrow range, like 8.3 to 8.7 inches, or maybe even tighter. Uh, depending upon on, on depending on the data that we have uh, as well. So determining the actual borehole diameter because it's not gauge, it's always there's always some pipe world, there's always other things that mean that the diameter is not going to be perfectly gauge. We treat R as a parameter. We set certain limits on other values in the linear elastic model using you know, if there's some rock mechanics work in the region or if there's some geophysical uh, uh, work in the region that allows us to, to constrain certain parameters. Or for example, if we know for sure that it's in a normal fault region, where, then we can set other limits on other values in the model and then choose an optimization approach. So this is the simple 
optimization minimization function that we use. C13 and C24 are the actual measurements. D13 and D24 are the calculated diameters based upon the set of parameters that are used for one calculation or what we call one realization. So this calculation gives us a, a function, uh, pardon me, gives us a, uh, an estimate of the error. And then we repeat with a new set of parameters and gradually uh, optimize uh, the solution to give you the most probable outcome, which is the one with the least error. In other words, we minimize this function subject to constraints of the stress regime. I mean, if, if I know we're in a thrust regime from other data, then I, I, I know very well that uh, sigma h uh, max is greater than sigma v. So I can put in some constraints there so that my optimization space is, is reduced to a smaller size. The more you can constrain the optimization space, the faster it executes, but these executions are, you know, at the most minutes. Uh, if we have unknown parameters like Young's modulus, we're also gonna put constraints on that. The pore pressure in the rock or the mud pressure. And of course we avoid all area, areas that have non-elastic non evidence like breakouts or drilling induced fractures. Everything is normalized because uh, you know, the, the difference between these two diameters that you see up at the top, the difference is really, really small, but the elastic modulus is, you know, 10 gigapascals. So that's, you know, like eight orders of magnitude difference in the numbers. So we have to normalize everything so that we don't, so that everything is weighted appropriately. And this is known in the uh, optimization literature as the use of a normalized weighted sum multi-objective function. There you go. So, uh, Here's some outcomes uh, the, from, a, from a simulation. C13, C24 are actual measured values in a borehole at several locations. We know that the sigma H min was 26 megapascals by a hydraulic fracture test nearby <coughs> in an adjacent well. So we use that as a, as a firm constraint. And we get sigma H max value of about 35. So we made a reasonable estimate. And by the way, we can, we can also add error bars to these estimates so that you have an idea of how reliable they are given the constraints and the assumptions we made. On the left, you see a, uh, a plot of the C13 and C24 uh, uh, in, in inches for a borehole. And on the right-hand side of that left-hand graph, that left-hand log, you see bars. Those bars indicate the sections that have passed the quality control criteria. We don't just analyze everything. Okay. Uh, so on the right-hand side, you see the outcomes. The modulus, which was uh, a, a parameter that was not specified, it was given a range, is on the left-hand trace of that right-hand uh, geolo uh, geological log. And uh, the value of sigma H min came out to be uh, 16 megapascals. And you can see the, the variations in it. And by the way, this corresponded extremely well to a leak off test, uh, sorry, a step rate test, which, I'm sorry, there was a bit of a glitch there. I touched the, I touched the cord. Uh, 16 megapascals, which, uh, which, which uh, corresponded very, very well with one uh, leak off test uh, nearby, actually one step rate test. So now we have a way of determining the stress gradients, or if you wish, the ratio between sigma H max and sigma H min uh, over the depth for which we have high quality uh, borehole diameter sizes. So here's a, a set of deep wells on the bottom, shallow wells up on the top for uh, the Karamai Basin in China, in West China. And here we have uh, included the estimates and the errors, uh, the errors uh, from our estimates. This is not necessarily the errors in, in, all, of the in all of the data. Uh, and what you see here is the, uh, 
plotted as the gradient of the uh, of the horizontal stress sigma h min uh, in one of these central columns, and then the ratio of sigma h min to sigma v. And we did the same thing for the sigma h max. And as you can see, uh, since these two numbers are both negative, are both uh, less than one, this is a normal fault situation. Okay, and uh, we did similar things deeper in the basin, and again uh, found all always normal faulting uh, normal faulting situations. Now. The first thing you're going to say is, is, yeah, well, yeah, but there's some viscous relaxation of the borehole. And guess what? If you adopt a real similar, a real simple model, like the Kelvin model here, which is just a, a three parameter model, uh, and, and you make uh, an assumption about a, a, the initial uh, strain and time when you make your, your measurement in your borehole, we can actually do this with a simple viscoelastic inversion. And that's uh, published in, uh, in his thesis and in some papers that have been published and that are forthcoming. So the Montney formation is pretty fabulous. You know, I'm not sure we're gonna be using natural gas a hundred years from now, or even 80 years from now, I suspect we will. Uh, but this formation alone has enough methane in it with current technology to meet Canadian consumption for over 400 years. Yeah, that's how much there is. And it's not really a shale, it's more of a silty sand and carbonate. But in order to drill their horizontal wells and then do stimulation, companies want to have stress data. Well, fortunately, Alberta and the Western Canada sedimentary basin is the best mapped stress area in the entire world, except for the San Andreas Fault. And you can see those little red lines and blue lines there. Those are the trajectories of the larger horizontal and smaller horizontal principal stresses. Uh, coming from previous work from the Alberta Geological Survey. So in this case, uh, we were provided with six wells uh, where we had good caliper data, 2,000 to 2,900 meters deep in the Montney Plate. Here's the six wells. Uh, that's the data availability on the top. And here are the inversions on the bottom. Guess what? We're not in a, uh, in a normal fault regime anymore. We're in a strike slip regime. Look at those values of horizontal stresses, uh, to the horizontal stress ratio to the vertical stress. It's a very, very strongly thrust fault regime. The uh, sigma H min, in some cases, is quite close, 0 0.9, 0 0.92 of the, of the vertical stress. So we're in a strike slip uh, uh, regime, but we're close to the thrust regime. Here's one of the wells, uh, about uh, 2,000 to 2,200 meters. And you can see here we have a good, a lot of really good intervals uh, with very high quality uh, control. So it, we were able to run the model on all of the, uh, on all of the, uh, the log almost. And there were three uh, uh, zones here that I just show you uh, blown up, just chosen. And you can see the values of, of the stresses from the linear elastic inversion and from the viscoelastic inversions uh, on each of the plots. It's interesting that the viscoelastic inversions are giving uh, you know, reasonably similar data and uh, somewhat smaller numbers, uh, but still quite reasonable. And the hydraulic uh, fracture tests that were done in this well uh, were in reasonable agreement with the with the with the outcomes that we that we did, so we've done seven case histories. They're all detailed in uh, in uh, Han Hong Shui's thesis. Uh, in the United States, New Brunswick, Alberta, British Columbia, and uh, Marcellus Shale in the states, and the uh, two two zones in the Katamari Basin in West China. So it's a new approach, and if you do your QC carefully and have good borehole data well, it's now allowing you to expand your stress data vertically. And of course, horizontally too, because you're gonna be doing this in, in different wells. The seven case histories demonstrate that we can have high confidence in the results and it doesn't require drill rig time. It just requires logs. So that means we're not spending hundreds of dollars an hour 
when the drill rig is just simply waiting for us to do a hydraulic fracture test. Of course, we're gonna combine this method or we do combine this method and everyone does the same thing with all kinds of other data, all the way from the very, very low resolution world stress map to the very high resolution data from individual boreholes over many, uh, you know, many orders of magnitude to try to constrain uh, the values of stress in the ground and understand them better. So in closing, remember that old engineering comment giggle or garbage in garbage out the quality of your input data impacts the quality of your results good initial stress estimates are needed for hydraulic stimulation and micro uh, micro seismic emissions predictions and and risk management and depletion and stress path analysis and uh geothermal work and on and on and on it's you, the better your stress estimates the better your predictive outcomes. So we have to combine the various approaches uh, to get reliable stress estimates. And I presented uh, you with uh, a new approach that is developed by uh, Han Hongshui and Yin Shunde and some, some, some other colleagues. And in retrospect, I uh, have this, uh, this photograph uh, in the jungle that I took the other day of a, an unknown species. And I, I call it an Arma dinosaur because uh, I'm somewhat of an Arma dinosaur. So uh, thank you for your time. And uh, I hope I haven't put you under too much stress. Well, thank you, Maurice. Uh, from one dinosaur to another, thank you sincerely. Uh, and and we, do have a, we do have a few questions and we have a time for a few more. Uh, Maurice, they're in the chat. I don't know whether you want to read them yourself or, or whether you'd like me to transcribe them. Okay, uh, uh, Jorg Herwander, hello Jorg, <laughs> haven't seen you for a while. Uh, don't you think that injectites could grow either as vertical tensile fractures or as inclined shear fractures in a normal faulting stress regime, depending on the relative magnitudes of SH min and, and SV? The answer of course, uh, Jorg, is you are right. If we have shearing events, uh, a shearing event uh, can certainly, uh, can certainly uh, be, be involved in a, uh, the, the development of an injectite. But I, I use that diagram on purpose because the other uh, diagrams that are, the, of injectites that I have seen are generally much, much more normal to the directions of the, uh, of, of the uh, minimum principal stresses, uh, shallow, uh, vertical, or, or horizontal, et cetera. But yes, you're right. I have simplified it in the interests of, of time. Uh, let's see. Uh, Maurice, you mentioned that the increasing the wellbore radius does not improve the geothermal efficiency. Can you comment on what does? Ha, delta T. <laughs> it all boils down to delta T. The hotter the rock, the better you are, because the more, the longer you can sustain the high exit temperatures. It turns out that if you're just putting in a heat pipe, we call those heat pipes, to suck the heat out just from the pipe itself without creating fractures, without creating advective flow within the rock mass, uh, and, and you'll see the results in a paper that's gonna be coming out shortly. Uh, the radius of the borehole has a remarkably small effect compared to the length. The length dominates. So as you saw from the curve, if you have a three kilometer length well, you, know, you can sustain a plateau temperature for many, many years that might be commercially acceptable. If you have a short length well, one kilometer, you may not be able to. So it's, it's uh, it's, it's, you know, that, that's what's dominating. Now, uh, the length of the well, the delta T uh, between the input uh, fluid and the rock, uh, the rock mass temperature, uh, those, are, th those are dominant. Now, when we do enhance geothermal systems, uh, we're, you know, the, the well bore diameter is somewhat irrelevant because we're circulating the fluid through natural fractures lots of surface area indeed. And uh, in those kind of systems, let me differentiate between two of them, said heat systems and uh, hot dry rock, or as I call it, not very hot dry rock in Canada. <laughs> the, uh, in the said heat systems, we're almost always producing uh, hypersaline brines, sodium chloride, calcium chloride, and all kinds of good things. Oh, by the way, 
you read the news from the uh, uh, Romanos project in Cornwall in England, where they have published that the lithium content of their brine that, uh, that, they're, that they're getting back from their enhanced geothermal system in hot, dry granite contains lithium that is like 50 times more than, uh, than, than normal and something like 10 times more than the most concentrated lithium uh, uh, fluid uh, that has been discovered, or some great numbers. So there you go. The Cornwall Geothermal Project just might become a lithium mine after all. But anyway, that's a geochemical issue. If we are circulating those heavily mineralized fluids uh, from, uh, from said heat, we're gonna have a massive uh, issue with, uh, with the scale on all of the steel goods. So if we are doing continuous circulation in an enhanced geothermal system, less so because we're putting in fresh water to start with. It will interact with the warm or hot rock, but the rock that we're going to be in is insoluble uh, for the most part. So we're not gonna have the really heavily mineralized brines. People are discussing the possibility of using uh, uh, casings that are made from uh, fiber, uh, carbon fiber and epoxy resins. Uh, that's being studied in Europe right now. And those casings are unfortunate. They're still about three times as expensive per meter as steel casings. But once we get a, a greater demand, now the, the scaling risk is associated with the presence of iron ions. And whenever you have a steel pipe, you have iron ions, unless, unless you go to one of these extremely expensive alloys, like extremely high nickel chrome steel or ha hastaloy where the casings I think are 20 times as expensive per meter than, or 10 times more expensive per meter than, than iron. So there's a whole bunch of parameters here that I, that I, that I can't get into. And, but yeah, they're all, they're all there. We have to balance all of them uh, in terms of uh, looking at potential commercialization. The next question is, uh, it's always a challenge to measure the shape of the borehole. Yep, guaranteed. Uh, this is, uh, I, I can't read the entire name here. Uh, let's see if I can expand my chat box. No, it just is from GA. It always is a, is a limitation, which is why we have to be very rigorous in applying our quality control criteria. We've seen some wells where you're lucky if you can get one good interval in 100 meters. We've seen other wells in very dense, strong linear elastic shales where we have 90% high quality borehole wall. So yes, we have to apply those quality control criteria very, very carefully. Uh, Ishmael, good to see you. Uh, what numerical technique is used for simulating the short circuiting of the EGS and how is the coupling between the fracture and the rock matrix done? Well, we couple the thermal flux models uh, with the uh, convective flux models, in other words, the fluid flow models, uh, with the stress strain models, which uh, allow for thermoelastic stresses and uh, allow for uh, changes in the stress that cause strains in, in the rock mass. So it's uh, what we call full THM coupling, okay? And it's advective flow in the fluid passing through the fractures of the borehole. It's conductive heat flux from the rock mass. It's perhaps, uh, and there's pressure drop, of course, pressure drop along the, along the fracture or along the well that we can simulate as well. Uh, but, and then there's also the, the stress strain behavior of the rock mass. It's complicated, it's time consuming. There is a lot of numerical uh, simulation burden here, but if we're gonna do better at predicting microseismic events, Ishmael, we're gonna to have to get better models uh, and uh, learn how to use them better. And, and we're working on that. Maurice, this oh. is Ali Donishi. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Uh, I've got a kind of a provocative question here. And that is, you basically do your calculations and then justify them with the hydraulic fracturing tests. So if, it, if you're using hydraulic fracturing tests as a justification, why not use it in the first place? Okay, uh, what we do uh, here, uh, the, the, the model that I showed you on the Montney formation with six wells took about a week. 
Well, for an engineer, that's uh, maybe 1500 uh, sorry, uh, maybe uh, $3,500 for the company. A hydraulic fracture test uh, in a deep borehole starts at $50,000. So there's your answer. It's a matter of time and money. Now, so, but, but then to justify your results, you still have to do the fracture. No, 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 that's not, that's not correct. We can make estimates. We can make estimates from depth and from known, uh, from known data, from vertical stresses, from uh, geophysical sonic logs. We can make estimates of the parameters to narrow their ranges, and then we get good results. I, I want to emphasize, Ali, that those results that you saw were not calibrated by the logs, uh, sorry, by the hydraulic fracture, except in the sense that one hydraulic fracture test was done in one of the cases, not all of them, uh, that gave us a, a value of 26 megapascals. And we did use that as a constraint uh, in our viscoelastic inversions. We don't need to have a calibration point to get reasonable data, but to get good data, even better, yes, a calibration does give us an additional constraint indeed, and that helps our optimization process. But we do still need to have an optimization uh, process to find the most probable answer. And by the way, I, I didn't emphasize that and I wanna emphasize it again. It is a most probable answer because we're doing a error minimization on an underdetermined problem. And, and I've got a second thing I'd like to get your opinion and that is you're justifying today's stress state with geological features which were created millions of years ago. I, you want to comment on that? Yeah, <laughs> that's, I think that's, that's, that's a, 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 one of the first things I say whenever I'm, I'm talking about stresses to, uh, to a class or, or to, to people, I'm, I'm going to say, look, the current faults and features that you see in the ground right now, they're millions of years old, some of them. It is no guarantee that those faults and features that you see in the ground are indicative of the present day stresses. You had better start doing some homework with good structural geologists and some rock mechanics people to try to deconvolve the stress regime. Uh, and there are so many ways of doing that. There's a, you know, leak off tests and step rate tests and hydraulic fracture tests and borehole deformation analysis and uh, structural feature analysis and breakouts analysis and, uh, and acoustic uh, wave uh, anisotropy uh, and et cetera, et cetera. So th this, is, this is a battle. This is a fight against nature. We have to collect all the information that we can and use all the weapons that we can to try to constrain that stress field. But the better we constrain it, the better our outcomes in, in prediction. And my last comment, my friend, keep up the good work. <laughs> well, <laughs> thanks, Ali. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's always a, a lot of fun working in areas where there's a, where there's a lot of uh, uncertainty because, you know, you can never really totally be wrong. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, those, are, those are the questions. Uh, one okay. last one from Igor, and then, then I think we need to wrap it up. Okay, Igor, can you pose your question personally? Because I don't see one. On, oh, Igor, I'm sorry. It's here, yes. He has a question regarding stress measurements from wellbore deformation. Uh, he's quite correct. The wellbore deformation inherently assumes that the well is first drilled and then deformed. It is not completely the case. There is some deformation happening just behind the drill bit and a little bit just in front. Those, Igor, are the reasons, along with bit whirl, and pipe whirl, that the radius of the borehole is not the radius of the drill bit. So by setting the radius of the borehole as an unknown parameter that is part of the optimization space, we can get a better estimate than we do if we just assume that the bit gauge or the bit gauge minus 1% or something is the, uh, is the, is the borehole diameter. Uh, no. We haven't done a three-dimensional model that estimates the effect of this uh, deformation just before the drill bit gets there and just after the drill bit uh, le leaves. Uh, 
we have done the two-dimensional plain strain linear elastic and viscoelastic uh, modeling, but it is limited to 2D, uh, so it can't take into account the effects that you uh, the, that you mentioned. I hope that this work can continue, or that somebody else will pick up this work and refine it and give us better understanding of the sources of potential error. But so far, on those seven case histories that we uh, studied. Uh, the ones where we had hydraulic fracture data, we were able to, to, uh, to, to show that our results are, are you know, very reasonable. And in some of the cases where we did not have hydraulic uh, fracture data, the stress state con conclusions that we extracted uh, corresponded to uh, the view of the structural geologists and uh, the stress state that might have been determined elsewhere in in, in the region in some offset wells. So we're fairly confident that it works to a degree, but that's why I use the word estimate. These are ways of estimating stresses. Well, Maurice, I, um, I think just, just in the interest of time, I, I know we could continue on for quite some time. Um, I, I really wanna thank you. It was a, a provocative conversation as, as we anticipated and it, and it and far-reaching, and and it really it it got me to thinking about uh, um, new ways of looking at at stress interpretation. And so so thank you so much. Well, uh, as one of the armored dinosaurs uh, uh, to another, I, I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, we're 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 trying to. We're trying to move ARMA forward by, by having some of the older people work with the younger people. Uh, and uh, I, I, I appreciate those opportunities and we'll trust we'll have more of them. Uh, remember that as we move more and more into the subsurface, for whatever reasons, carbon dioxide sequestration, uh, biosolids disposal, which is also carbon sequestration, only in solid form, which is really good. And, and the biosolids, of course, degrade and generate methane. Hey, we can actually use hydraulic fracturing to inject biosolids and generate green methane. Mm. So there's all kinds of opportunities out there. And the new generation is going to make much better use of the subsurface than we have. And with fewer environmental mistakes than we have. But a key factor is understanding the stress fields as vital inputs into all of our simulation attempts, even our simple linear elastic calculations that we make. So oh, thanks a lot, John. And John, one last comment. That dinosaur resembles you a little bit more than it does Maurice. It doesn't have a mustache that. and it doesn't, he's not wearing glasses. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And take Jake, care, uh, take care, all of you. It's, know uh, what dinosaurs are. <laughs> it's great. It's great to hear from you. And of course, I, I give uh, Arma full permission to uh, post the recording, and uh, I will send you a PDF copy uh, of uh, of these slides if you wish to post them as well, John. Thank you again, Maurice. Thanks okay. everyone for participating. Thanks, Maurice. Hey, how do, hey, get, hey, how do hey, I get out of Zoom? Oh, well, don't don't go out yet because I asked to have to ask a favor. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, darn. <laughs> yes, well, it's because I screwed up. I, I I got listening to your rant and I forgot to turn the recording on until part way through. Um, do you think you'd be willing to record re-record maybe the first few slides and send it to me as a movie and I'll splice it together? Yeah, I'll send it to you as a PowerPoint presentation. Yeah, okay. that'd, be, that'd be cool. Yeah, sorry about that. I, I mean, uh, yeah, you probably I, I have just, to have an IT person met, uh, blend the two uh, the, 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 the two techniques. I, I don't know how to do it on a, uh, except through the PowerPoint recording. Yeah. And, and that's fine. I, I think um, um, uh, I've got the software that I can probably splice the two together. Right. Um, I'll, I'll let you know how much I screwed up. I think... <laughs> Missed the first five slides. 
Or well, you're known, you're you're now known as the exorcist, so I'm sure you can exorcise <laughs> the, the demons from anything that you do. Well, I, I, I'm now known as as the I don't know what that is. It's not a velociraptor. It's it's <laughs> some goofy looking uh, plant eater. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those those darn plant eaters. They're taking over the world. You know. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's it's a very accurate representation. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks again, Maurice. Okay. Okay. Stay well, and I'll 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 get out of Google one way or another here when I uh, shut everything down there.